Hello everyone, my name is Angela Domasova and I'm the founder and trainer at Luxembourg School of Contemporary Etiquette. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you today again at Lux Etiquette and Service Café, uh, the only space of the kind in Luxembourg. Luxembourg is a good role model of a great host country for people of so many nationalities uh, from so many countries. Diversity, inclusion, integration, they are not just words for us, we live it. And uh, uh, this country takes really great care of all the people in Luxembourg who are unique and very special. Uh, I love meeting people here and uh, uh, I see it as my true calling and uh, mission to present you in the most uh, authentic way, inviting you for a con uh, conversation over a cup of coffee, great people of Luxembourg who truly impact and influence our life. They might be living next door and we are not aware of them, but it's them who create present and future of this great country. We all are different, we all have different values, beliefs, we all belong to different uh, religious groups. However, such diversity makes this world a beautiful place to live. Now I want you to make your cup of coffee, sit comfortably and meet my today's guest. Today at Lux Etiquette and Service Café I have invited a very special person. Uh, he has a diverse international experience of living and working in so many countries. He is a Redemptorist, he is a, a Catholic priest at St. Alphonse Church of Luxembourg. Welcome, Father Michael Cusack. Thank you, Angela, and it's lovely to be with you. Yeah. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation, Father. You're most welcome. Uh, you know, they say that some successful people have the same habit, like common habit. They wake up early. Are you an early bird? I am definitely an early bird. I'm a, I'm a late owl as well. I don't go to bed too early. I'm up every morning at 6.15 and I'm out on the streets of Luxembourg at 6.30. Streets of Luxembourg, so yeah. are you enjoying walking in streets Absolutely of Luxembourg? Absolutely love it, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I hit out and I do 5.5 kilometres every morning and then my exercise is praying during the time I'm out, going through the lovely parks and then back here for my shower and breakfast and prayer in the morning with the community. Mm. So, have you arrived just recently to Luxembourg? Yeah, How long I, ago? I, I only arrived here in, in um, October really to take up mm. the new job, okay. but um, I have been, I've been trying to find where I should be working uh, for the past year maybe, mm. and uh, the idea of coming to Luxembourg came in, in August, mm. so I did a little bit of homework and... Some preparation inside. <laughs> yeah, to try and see what it worked out, and I'm still on trial, but I'm loving it. That's your first impression. So, and uh, you have been to so many uh, cities and uh, towns in the world. Uh, uh, what's your first impression of Luxembourg? Well, my first impressions of Luxembourg come from many years ago because I lived here in ah. 19, 1982. Ah. I came here, so that's 38 years ago. Ah. Uh, I worked in Kirchberg in the Holiday Inn uh, ah. in the laundry. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was coming to learn French and I ended up working with three Portuguese women in a laundry and they only spoke Portuguese. So. Was it like a student's job? It was a student job okay. and uh, I, I loved Luxembourg that time. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't over learning French. Uh, I have a little bit of French and I'm trying to learn it now. So, But my impressions of Luxembourg are that it's a fabulous place to live. You know, it's a wonderful, and where I'm located here in the Couvent, yeah. uh, Saint Alphonse, it's, it's just right in the center of town. So it's oh, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, you know, today um, I will not just ask my questions, but I will also ask questions of those who are viewing us and uh, my friends living in Luxembourg. So the first question is from a teenager. What is your daily routine and what does a working day of a priest look like? Okay, well, the daily routine is, there is a slight routine in the day, which is that part that I said of getting up and getting my exercise and then going to prayer. And then whatever jobs are, are in the um, timetable for the day, they come through the secretary and it could be anything from meeting with somebody who has a problem in life that they want a discussion with, it could be the sacraments of the church, mm. it could be as you know the weekends I will have masses to prepare and liturgy to yeah. prepare. Um, it also involves 
also social life as well because part of the work of a priest is to try and integrate into people's lives. Uh, during the week here I will also work with confirmation class and youth class but because of COVID everything is very very different oh, yes. and uh, we're held back a lot but I have a busy, I have a busy week and a varied week. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden the timetable can change if there's somebody sick somebody in hospital you have to go yeah. maybe the week will be interrupted by a death mm. all of a sudden everything has to change and be re-timetabled for that but it's a great it's a great life and i love it mm. uh, for the michael you're a redemptorist yes and uh, if you uh, refer to wikipedia the source of information for everything nowadays you know wikipedia says that the redemptorists or the congregation of the most holy redeemer is a religious congregation of catholic church dedicated to missionary work and it was founded by Alphonsus Liguri in at Scala in Italy, like in 18th century. Is that right? Yes, in 1732. Yeah, okay. Alphonsus was one. Of, I mean, in, in in the 18th century in Italy, there were many many priests, and it yeah. was really overrun with priests. Alphonsus was a, was a young um, lawyer and uh, he, very gifted from a noble family. He's a painter, he's, he's a musician, he's an author. Um, throughout his life he had a prolific life as, as a writer of moral theology. But he became disgruntled with living in a way and had a mental breakdown and decided to go and take time away and he lived went up to the hill in Scala which is above the Amalfi coast the most beautiful part of Italy mm. but from there he was trying to rest and rest his spirit and rest his soul and try and figure out what he should do with his life and uh, while he was there he noticed that there were lots of people who were abandoned there were no priests yeah. to work up in this rural mountain area and it was from there that he decided to set up a congregation that would work with the most abandoned but also with a mission that would preach the good news of Jesus Christ as good news. So that is our continued mission today and it has brought me to all over the world. Mm. And who are the members of your congregation? We have thousands of members uh, worldwide and um, we have um, men and women and lay co-workers. So um, we have priests and brothers who form the, the mainstay of the Redemptorists. Then the Redemptorist deans are an enclosed order of religious nuns who are our sisters. They back our work with their prayer and uh, they have a wonderful spirituality. Actually one of the growing groups in the church mm -hmm. are the contemplatives. Mm -hmm. And then we also have lay co-workers mm -hmm. who, who take on the mission of the Redeemer the mission of the Redemptorist to, to try and preach this good news as good news. And I think that's the big challenge, Angela, you know, is to make good news be heard as good news yes. in a world that doesn't hear so much, you know? Yeah, and we'll talk about it today, mm -hmm. yes, because now the times are really challenging. Mm. And another question from my friend, the Italian friend Camilla. Uh, when and why did you decide to dedicate your life uh, to priesthood? Well, I, I listened to somebody answer that question very recently and he's 87 years old. 87. And when he was asked that question, he said, when and why? He said, the last time I dedicated my life was this morning, Ooh. which was a lovely answer Ooh, because, you know, answer. it's profound, it's deep. I first met the Redemptorists when I was 14 years old. Mm. They came to my town giving a mission, which was preaching in the church. And I entered the congregation when I was just 16. So early, wow. went so, to... Uh, was, was the procedure of entering congregation, if you could do it at 16? So did, did back, you get special then, education? For yes, you? I had to have secondary school completed and have my matriculation for university at that time. But, uh, but I had that, so I mean, I went to school early. Uh, we were a big family, there were seven of us at home. So um, we lived beside the school and I went to school earlier than most. In today's world, we will not accept people who are 16 years of age because they're still considered minors. But uh, I went and I joined then. And I suppose I had nine years of training uh, before I was ordained. And that included a variety of work, uh, both in Ireland and in Brazil. Mm. And uh, the, the question of when you decide, I think I decided every year that I was continuing in it. Mm. Um, maybe after my experience in Brazil, I got more certainty that this is what I want to do. And I feel that this is what God wants me to do. Um, 
But I've had many times when I've had to recommit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to start again and yeah. remember why. It's like any relationship, you know. Uh, my relationships with my, those I live with and the congregation, people can be in marriages that need to recommit and it doesn't always go easy, but um, it's good overall. Does it mean that you could stop any time? Um, not really, but I have stopped a few times, you know, oh. during my lifetime uh, I've got burnt out a few times, you know, I felt that I had nothing more to give, mm -hmm. uh, exhausted from work and um, rather than take on a new position, I would have said to my bosses, I need to take time away. So I lived for one year on my own, uh, it was my first time ever living alone, um, that was back in 2005 and then last year I did the same thing. I had come out of a very heavy routine of 14 years as a, as a superior in a community, a big build and reconstruction of a monastery, and I was very tired and mentally tired. When you're, when you're tired that way, we're blessed in our congregation that we can take time out mm -hmm. because in, in the world of other people, they don't have that possibility, you know, um, because their con commitments continue. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you lived alone for the first time in your life, meaning outside the family and outside your brothers and sisters. And Just alone, alone. On my own, in a house, on wow. my own, as the only person in the house. I was brought up in a house with nine people, oh. you know. So then I moved to a monastery with maybe 25 people in it, uh, or, or thereabouts. And then this was the first time I was ever in a house with nobody else there with me. It was scary. The first mm -hmm. night, the second night, I was afraid when I'd hear a noise, you know? Yeah, even though I was an adult, but oh. uh, it was a very different experience. And I loved it then. How After, old were you? Oh, I was well up in my, um, I'm sure I was 36 or seven, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, I had the experience living in Brazil of being with a small number, maybe two or three of us in the house, but never alone. Oh. And this was my first time. So when you're alone, you start to talk to yourself, you know. Oh. <laughs> wow, uh, yeah, <laughs> meditate. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so normally uh, during the whole life you have been serving to others. And yeah, and now we are at Lexa Etiquette and Service Cafe, so we are serving each other. And uh, there are so many definitions of service. In, in uh, your uh, homilies, in, um, you said once that we come to serve each other generously as it is in giving that we re will receive. Yeah, absolutely. That's your quote. Yeah. <laughs> so service and service attitude, what is it for you? Yeah, for me, it's very much as you have defined there, you know, and it's, it's my quote, but it's quoting from the Bible in, in a way, you know, it is in giving that we receive. My world has been all about service and the Christian calling uh, of all Christians is to serve, to serve our brothers and sisters humbly. That may mean for me being patient, uh, sitting and listening to somebody, hearing their, hearing their difficulties, trying to help. But I think the greatest gift of all is be, is your time, you know, to take time. I'm taking time with you and with your, um, those who, who, who tune in today, you know, I, it's the gift of time is the most precious gift that we have. Absolutely. In our world today, mm, the greatest gift that we can give to family, to the sick, to the poor, we don't have to solve all the problems, but give your time and your mind. And in that giving, I have received always 100 fold back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's uh, precious and also valuable. They say that some rich people say they don't need money, they need time. Uh, is service about love as well? Because the church tells us, let us uh, treat uh, one another with love, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, is it about love? Oh, the bottom, the driving force in all faith is, is love, that we're called to love, but God is love. And it's in these encounters that we find God, hopefully. Um, it's amazing the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And we, we have no control over that. I can be just present with somebody and for them that can be a miraculous moment, you know, of, of just joy. It can be a word, it can be silence, it can be something that we do without even intending, but with good intention, you know, with, with a good desire to help and suddenly it means the world to somebody else. I, I have many friends in Ireland over the years who say to me things like, you know, you have always been there for us. Mm. And being there for somebody 
is a very important thing in today's world because we can't even on the telephone if you want to get it through to an airline or to an office it's an answering machine and it's wait and hold and send us an email and we will get back to you and it's never I am here for you you know so this is a very important and that is love you know, love is when, you know, from my mother who's back in Ireland, every day I will contact her by Viber, mm. but I will see her face and she sees me and we pray together every single day mm. at 12 o'clock in Ireland, which is one o'clock here, we will pray the prayer of the Angelus mm. and she has a hello and that's an important part of her day. But I am present to her just as we are present to your viewers now. Mm. Um, it's a very big gift. Yeah. Um, to be able and then people can people can get a so, some sort of a lift into their into their lives just by experiencing that mm. uh, in Greek philosophy um, they differentiate between uh, a few uh, forms of love and they even have different words for that and I again went to uh, Wikipedia and they found that they have like storge, love affection and especially for parents and children uh, philotia, self-love uh, to love oneself or regard to one's own happiness or advantage for me it's like selfish a little mm -hmm. bit but anyway philia, uh, affectionate regard, friendship Mm -hmm. And Eros, love mostly of sexual passion. Mm -hmm. Xenia, the action, Asian Greek concept of hospitality, generosity and courtesy, which is close to my etiquette. <laughs> and Agape, which is love, especially charity, the love of God for men and of men for a good God. Mm -hmm. and like the highest uh, uh, top level of love. Uh, it's interesting how people try to find the purpose in love. But what to do if uh, a person uh, has uh, to treat uh, one another with love but has some negative emotions? Well, love is, love is a driving force and I think all of those that you have mentioned from Greek philosophy, they are, they are all categories of love but one feeds into the other, you know. I mean, eros shouldn't be eros on its own, agape has to be part of eros as far as I'm concerned. And in our service and in our understanding of, of that whole concept of love, mm -hmm. um, it should be again a driving force that is positive. Mm -hmm. Now I know negatives come in, but the negatives aren't necessarily part of, uh, of any of the definitions of love. Mm -hmm. They come in with greed and selfishness, yeah. they're the opposites. Okay. And they're the things I suppose that traditionally we call sin. You know, uh, and it's in all of our lives. We have the capability of going one way or the other and where most of us are a mix of both mm -hmm. you know so while I might like black and white yeah yes. we're yeah. gray the world is gray you know it, yeah. it's not as it's yeah. not two poles mm -hmm. the, the, the everything is meets in some place mm -hmm. like but golden the, middle no? yeah but you don't necessarily want to stay in the middle uh -huh. you maybe want to challenge yourself to go further towards love yeah. and less towards selfishness or certainly that's what the church would want us mm -hmm. to do and I believe that's what Christ came to tell us to do you know mm -hmm. well actually uh, uh, when Jesus came he was the first to teach us unconditional love and in one of the conversations with uh, a friend of mine we discussed uh, the issue of unconditional love and they said that parents love uh, children unconditionally like Godfather loves us unconditionally and uh, uh, he had, we had a, a discussion and a kind of an argument because he said no parents don't love their uh, kids unconditionally they have different emotions sometimes uh, they feel not very positive and uh, uh, it's not unconditional but do you think that uh, love could be unconditional yeah I think and I think you work towards that I think parents are probably the best example of that but they're not it's not exclusive to them you know mm -hmm. there are parents who do not love in unconditionally yeah, there are ones who are bad parents um, mm -hmm. but I think of somebody maybe in the older generation who knows how to love all of their children for example my mother every now and again for a joke I will say to her you love me the most <laughs> and she'll say no I love all of you equally and I believe that I believe she does she may have uh, more fun with one than with the other but in her heart there is none of the seven of her children that she does not want mm. she wants them all and that's the type of unconditional love but God is greater than this and it's when we imagine somebody greater than 
our parents, if we've had a good experience of parents, but I'm always conscious that in our world there are people who do not have a good experience or have not had, a, a, and no, thankfully it's not too many, but there are people for whom this talk of unconditional par parental love is not a reality. Mm -hmm. You know, people who have felt rejected by their mother or by their father, or, you know, there's a very shady past in our world of, of rejection of people, maybe people who are adopted today, who have the blessing of being adopted, and yet somewhere in their mind there's the question, why was I, why did that have to happen in the first place? Mm -hmm. And I know many of people with that story, you know, so, but Thankfully, um, I think the general thing is that there is an effort at unconditional love. And uh, it also relates to happiness, because uh, uh, um, uh, another thing uh, this person mentioned to me was that not everybody knows how to be happy, because they never experienced it in their childhood. Uh, are you a happy person? <laughs> I think I am, yeah, I think I am. And I think, you know, some people, happiness eludes them because maybe they're in the moment that is happiness. I have a friend who's always searching for more and I, I tend to say to him, maybe this is happiness, maybe this is where you should be trying to get the most out of it, like, you know, how much do you give to the moment to allow that happiness? I'm happy generally, I mean, I'm not free from, uh, in truth, I'm not free from depression or from, from moments that pull me down, but I know that if I have to be effective in a group, I need to put the best foot forward. And even when I'm feeling down, I try to be happy. Mm -hmm. I can act the fool a little bit too, which is fun, you know? I have found myself at times, even in tragic situations, being the one who lightens the, the, the moment, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of life, you know, even in sorrow, there's room for happiness. Mm -hmm. And I remember when my father passed away, you know, and I'd have this experience from many funerals, you can be sitting at a funeral and there are people laughing. Mm -hmm. And some people would say, well, this is disrespectful. And I think, no, they, they are having a conversation about maybe their own life or their own experience. And there's room for that. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've any, if you've heard about Irish wakes, you know, when people die in mm -hmm. Ireland, it's a big, big moment for people to be able to sit with the body oh. at home. And people come and they tell stories and, you know, they're always, they're huge. The funerals at home are huge. Mm -hmm. And it's a- With the body presented. With the body present, yeah. People come in, pay their respects to oh. the body and then sit with the family. There's always a cup of tea okay. or there oh. can be a drink yeah. or there's a, there can be a, tent outside where any people... Any traditional drinks for, or any traditional... Oh, there can be, but people can choose. Some families will decide no alcohol, okay. uh, some will give alcohol, okay. but it's always a great moment of healing for the family mm -hmm. also. This is missing from, from the world today because of COVID, mm -hmm. and we are actually very worried about many families who have gone through bereavement during the COVID time because you can't hug them and you can't be with them and you can't tell the stories. Yeah. So um, I think like uh, that happiness, happiness is something that we all are expected to control. And there's nothing worse than finding somebody who sits in, you know, um, with a sad face, like, a, like, a, like an inanimate object. And you want to say, come on, smile, live, live a little bit, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, in, uh, one, in your service, you use the words, uh, bring us to an everlasting life, addressing it to the Lord. And uh, uh, doesn't it sound a bit passive, like bring us to the everlasting world? For me, like uh, we should bring something to uh, there for the everlasting world, our good deeds, uh, something good for eternity. It's, that's kind of a sense of living. Uh, yeah. Force. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true, Angela. But um, but we we bring. But our prayer is that God will bring us with what we bring. You know. Ah. So it's a prayer of hope and confidence and faith. Really, mm -hmm. the wording is sort of strange, maybe. But our prayer is that God will bring us into this everlasting light. Mm -hmm. But how do we get there? It's by our good deeds and by our kindness and by our smiling and by our moments like this, you know, where you take time with people. Mm -hmm. That's what brings us there. Mm -hmm. And how we live our lives is, is the most important. It's not what we do, yeah. it's, it's how we do it really, mm -hmm. you know.
interesting. Uh, another question comes from my friend uh, from Croatia, Mirjana, and she is living in Luxembourg. Uh, what are your views on religion and self-improvement? Uh, we are now bombarded with messages of self-improvement, of how to be a better version of, the, of ourselves. And where is religion in all that? And should religion be more focused on self-improvement or acceptance, forgiveness? Yeah, well, uh, what's your friend's name again? Miriana. Miriana. Uh, I mean, all of these things I think religion has provided for. But there are new sciences, you know, these are new businesses that are around self-improvement business, self-improvement books. They won't talk about trying to be the best person you can be, which is all that it is. The same is true about, let's say, confession and you have therapies and psychiatrists and psychologists and psychotherapists. Very often people used a confessional mm -hmm. scenario for that. Now maybe the help wasn't, you didn't pay for it, so uh, it's now become a business model for many people and I'm not for a moment knocking those, but I think the choices, sometimes faith can actually provide and, and the services of church provide for that. Um, the whole concept of faith and religion for me, and I think for all, should be to be our best self. Mm -hmm. And how do, how do I become my best self? Uh, I think we at times need to have groups that will help us to get there, mm -hmm. help us to cope with the things that we're not coping with, like self-help groups. Again, these are free groups. Yeah. They don't demand a charge. Whereas the books and the, and the, the self-help and all of these can tend to be just somebody putting on paper mm -hmm. what is evident in many ways. But um, yeah, Jesus was a storyteller. I have a friend, a storyteller, and he's married to a storyteller. And they use their storytelling to help people to live their lives better. And I think that's a bit like what we're doing here in conversation. You know, we don't have the magic answers and my answers are only my answers, but they're based on my experience. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I think this, the whole area of self-help is very evident. And it is a driving force again in what we try to do in faith uh, with families, with young people growing up. My biggest desire for young people is that they will be themselves mm. and try to be themselves and understand that God has made them to be themselves. Mm. Uh, Virginie, a friend of mine, she's a coach. She is from France, living in Luxembourg, and she uh, is asking a question which is related very much to this one. Uh, she's saying that there are so many coaches of various types nowadays, and in fact, I guess that uh, Jesus was the first coach ever. He came to teach, and uh, uh, he was telling us stories, and those stories helped us to live through this life. And uh, she's asking, what do you think of coaching? Of, uh, like life coaching. Life yeah, coaching. again, I think it's the same answer really to the last one. You know, life coaching has its place. Um, I suppose in church we use what we might call a spiritual director to help you on that spiritual path. Coaching, mm, again, I, I don't know if it's always necessary, but this girl is clearly a coach and she makes her living from being a coach, so I better say that it's important for some people. There are people who, who, who end up falling off the tracks of life and maybe they need to be coached. And is the coaching for the management of their time to decide how to get a good work-life balance? You know, it's all about balance in the end of the day. And I think the same is true. If you ask me, why do I get up at 6.15 in the morning? It's because I need to walk. And I need to walk in order to keep my weight at some decent level, but I also need to walk to give my head space, to allow me to pray, and to help me to feel that I have that part of my life. So I'm coaching myself in that. Now before that, I had extra weight on me and I went to a group called Weight Watchers, you know? <laughs> and in Weight Watchers, it was the same thing. It was coaching, it was somebody who was there, but I paid for it. You know, I paid for somebody to tell me I'm fat, but I can be thin, <laughs> I can be thin. So I didn't mind doing it the first time, but now I know the, I know the tricks now, you know? So I, have, I, will, I will apply my own rules. And I know that there are three basic rules when it comes to weight loss. Stop laughing at me, Angela. This is the truth. There are three basic. One is close your mouth from the food, you know? You can't keep stuffing the food and expect to become thin. The other is to, is to, try, to, to try to exercise 
and, and, and the whole thing is about balance. Look at the content of your food and try and eat healthy. So there you have it. Okay, so I should be looking much better. I know. Now, I know. I would never. Uh, well, I if you saw me, I wouldn't fit in the room. I would never imagine you were visiting this group. So. <laughs> oh, I wasn't the biggest person in the group, you know, but yeah. but I went here. Yeah. So uh, and uh, Virginie is suggesting that maybe some uh, uh, should be governmental structures for coaches uh, who would uh, formal like a formal structure so that the younger generations are coached by older generations. Do you think that this uh, um, uh, relationship between younger and older generations is important in people's life? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's part. Of, it's the part of the structure that we live in. Even in schooling, you know, the teachers are older than the pupils, so you ex expect that the teachers will bring the experience of 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 their life to to play in how they're going to relate to the young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's yeah. I think it's very important. But again, it's the balance. You know, I think balance is where it's all at. And do governments need to sponsor? Well, governments pay for the education usually, so you'd expect that within that then that the skill sets that are needed by young people would be in place. And I'll just give you one example, if you don't mind of that. Yes, sure, it's a exactly. different example. I have an aunt, my father's sister is a religious sister, you know, a presentation sister, and she was in education for most of her life. And she would say that the greatest skill that they need to teach in school, they don't teach. Mm. And that is to teach young people how to study, ah. how to use their time. That's the greatest coaching they need. Ah. And unfortunately, now maybe they do it here in Luxembourg yeah. in some schools, but unfortunately in many countries, it's when you finish school that young people say, well, I actually didn't know how to study. Mm. Uh, it would have been good to have had a subject called how to study, yeah. how to set your times right. Not about copying answers, yeah. but about time management. Yeah. Because if you're looking again at the work-life balance and mm -hmm. your friends there who are in coaching or, or in influencing, all of that has to do with balance. Mm. And I'll keep coming back to balance because it's about this holistic approach to life, which involves our spiritual life, our physical life, our mental health, you know, ev all of our relationships. All of this is part of uh, who we should be in the fullness of life. Mm. I don't envy those children who go to school these days. You know, there is such a big amount of information everywhere and they don't even know which is fake or which is true. You mm -hmm. know, it's quite difficult. Yes, how to study, it's important. Uh, another question from Sophia and uh, she's saying that your, she's asking uh, your attitude of uh, pride. Uh, in ancient Greece, pride was not a sin. And however, they didn't welcome hubris. Uh, a personality quality of extreme or foolish pride or dangerous overconfidence, often in combination with arrogance, like when somebody is mocking all over another person, you know, like mm -hmm, <coughs> mm -hmm. and such people would not get to Elysium fields, they believe, after death. But uh, in Orthodox religion, pride is a sin. Uh, what's your attitude? Is it uh, a sin in uh, Catholicism? It is. It fits within the realm of sins. But I mean, you have to have a certain amount of pride. I think we should have pride in ourselves, you know, which isn't a sin. Um, I think to be this mix that you talk of with arrogance and seeing yourself above somebody else, this is always the borderline of sin. Mm. It's like wealth. Wealth in itself isn't a sin, you know, but selfishness that it can create yes. or the power that it, it's, it's about power, I think. And I think everything is about power. It's the, 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 the wrongs that are in our church are about power. The wrongs that are in society are about power. The inequality in our world is about power. Some person holding power, some group of people holding power over another. And uh, I think that really, um, again, we're striving once again, I'm back, I'm back to, this, to this balance in things. Have pride in who you are, in how you present yourself, in your job, in your work, and you know, there's no sin in that. There's no sin in wanting to have a comfortable home and keep your home clean and tidy and, you know, ordered in some way. Um, but I suppose if you come with the attitude that says, I am greater than everybody else, mm. um, none of us is greater. We're all equal. 
uh, or should be. Mm -hmm. But there are people who think they're greater. Mm -hmm. And you'll see them, you know, with, they might be driving the bigger car. And there's no need for the bigger car, really, when you mm -hmm. think of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the car only has the four wheels mm -hmm. and it can only go at the same speed. Absolutely. Even though you can have a car that has the possibility of going to 500 kilometers an hour or whatever it is, the speed limit is still at 50, you know. It's one part that drives me crazy yeah. when I get onto an aeroplane mm -hmm. and I see that they have this, you know, we welcome now, when you're ready, we welcome our business and blue class passengers and six people go up and they sit in the same seats and they, then there's a little curtain is pulled and you know, you think, what is this about? If the, if the plane crashes, we all die. You know, you don't die easier than me. Yeah. <laughs> We're all in the one plane, yeah. you know, but you have paid three times the price for your seat because you need to be separated from the people who can infect us back in the economy class. Mm -hmm. You know, this is where the standards of the world are wrong, I think, mm -hmm. uh, when we sit ourselves above. You know, I think the plane is a great example. Yeah, it's a very good example, yeah. yes. Yeah, very picturesque. I would say that it's quite related with confidence and overconfidence, yes. And uh, uh, how to be confident, how to uh, have like uh, a proper self-esteem. Do you think uh, there should be an ex there should be some advice here for our viewers? Yeah, I think so. I think it's important that we get hang with the right company, be with the right people who allow you to grow in confidence. Mm -hmm. And there are people in our world today who have no confidence because it's been knocked out of them. Oh. You know, it, it hasn't been allowed to develop. They've been in wrong, even at home, maybe in their home environment. Nobody has said to them, you are beautiful as you are, you know? And maybe some friends are, who you think are friends are telling you that you're ugly or you need to do this or you need to do the other. You know, all of this knocks mm. at your self-confidence. And I think to be confident people, we have to be people that are trusted. And we only find that when we hang with the right people. Mm. And I think that's a lesson maybe for the younger generation mm. sometimes. Your parents might look at who you are hanging around with or you know, who your friends are or, and see that there is bad influence rather than... That is the fear. That's the fear of a protective mother or a protective father. I want my child not to be better than anybody else, but I want it to be in the right company. Not with company that's going to pull them down or make them feel less uh, important within themselves. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have this huge world of, of social influence mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. for young people. You know, they can be bullied uh, directly, mm -hmm. either in school or at home or in the playground, but they can also be reached all the time through their phone mm -hmm. by nasty, chipping comments. And then, then I think the scale of the world does it too, because we look at personalities who you think, well, why? Why do you want to be that person? You know, celebrities and wealthy people, okay, they have the big cars and the fast cars and the holidays and the houses and the clothing, but they have no peace. Yeah. You know, they have no, they have to always feel that they have to be looking beautiful, you know, and to look beautiful for some, they have to be doctored up with all sorts of treatment, you know, and you think, you know, what is wrong with the world? And yet, that's the magnet. Mm. That's what pulls young people to say, I want to be there. It's the dream. Mm. And yet the dream, it's like we have a saying in English that says, far away hills are green. So when we look over yeah. here, we can think, oh my God, mm -hmm. we will go. But when you get there, you say, why? Mm -hmm. There's one woman one time in Ireland, she won, she won the Euro Millions. And I think she won something like, oh, this is many years ago, but maybe 110 million euros. Mm -hmm. Now she lives in a fenced off house. Before this, she could go with her friends and have coffee and sit with you or sit with me. Now, bodyguards, mm -hmm. you know, she's not safe. She's living in a comfortable world, mm -hmm. but it's in a, a pod, you know, it's like a little yeah. closed off area. Mm -hmm. This is the danger of wealth. Money is temptation. <laughs> yeah, but you know, what do you do with the money yeah. when you have it? Maybe yeah, the yeah. best thing would be to give most of it away yeah, and bring said, happiness. To be wealthy is not the same, but uh, how you uh, manage being well, wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it doesn't, I mean, wealth and fame yeah. don't bring with them exactly. everything that we think because it brings danger and it brings fear and it brings, you know, lots of wrong company into your life and you can afford everything. And when you can afford everything, then maybe you settle for, you don't know what you actually need, you know? Mm -hmm. but, um.
So for the Michael, you believe that uh, you believe that uh, young generation they should know how to they should learn how to uh, surround themselves with the right people. Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, they go to school, they don't have a big choice. Uh, if uh, they are in uh, uh, outside in the street, they don't have a big choice. How to pick up the right people? Mm. Well, I think I think what they need to, to know. Prepare yourself for that. Yeah, I think they need to know that it's it's. They need to know that that the adults who are around them are there in their favor. They want the best for them. And that's why I think it's important for younger people to talk to their parents. Mm -hmm. And hopefully their parents are able to listen, you know, and hear what it is they want. Because there are, there are two um, pulling forces there. One is to be popular and hang with a group, even when you're uncomfortable to do that. Mm -hmm. And the other is to be where you want to be, and maybe you can't find it, you know. So you want acceptance, mm -hmm. you want love, you want to be popular, you want, you know, all these things are, are there competing. They're all competing forces. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I think young people, thankfully today, I mean, lots of young people have confidence, but they must also accept what they can around them and build around them mm -hmm. what is good for them. And that's why I would often say, and this is me coming back to faith again, yeah. you know, that faith, it's a pity. I, I, I feel bad for those who don't have faith mm. because I think faith is a tool that has helped me greatly. Mm. And it's a gift and it's a gift that I would love to give to others because with that gift comes a sense of a philosophy that says it's okay to be you and the most important thing for you is to be happy and that this is how you can find happiness. Mm -hmm. You can find happiness in a loving home. You know, there are lots of standards there, but hopefully you can begin to identify what's right and what's wrong and what brings happiness. Mm. Uh, during your Holy Communion some days ago, a few days ago, you addressed children with these words. Remember the light of your first communion day. And uh, uh, what is it for you to hold this light in your heart? Yeah, I, I was lovely working with the young children. You know, for them again this year, they were supposed to make their communion, oh, yes. the first communion in June, and it was postponed. And we only had some, a small group, uh, that were able to make the communion this year. But the light is the gift that God gives us in the Eucharist. And when we receive the body of Christ, as we do as Catholics, we believe that Jesus is truly present with us. Mm -hmm. And if that is a light force that you believe is here, you know, it's in your heart, it's, it's something that you don't see, but it's there. Mm -hmm. And faith is, is, are the eyes that help you to understand that. Mm -hmm. So for me then that means actually I'm never alone. So when I say I lived for the first time in my life many years ago on my own, I wasn't alone because in faith I should understand that God is with me mm -hmm. in every moment mm -hmm. and that I can draw on this force within me. Just as I have a beating heart here, I don't have to think to make it beat. It happens, you know, and it keeps the blood circulating and all the science that's there. I also have a spirit mm -hmm. and that spirit is a life force and the children have that they have it naturally from from birth but in communion we have this special gift and when they understand i think that jesus says do this in memory of me not just coming and receiving the body and sharing at the table but learning and hearing being coached if we need to use secular words for it being coached by jesus into a way of happiness that tells us to share that tells us to be grateful, that tells us to be patient, that tells us not to fight, that tells us to be forgiving, that tells us to be just. I saw two young girls the, the other day, I was going to the post office here in Luxembourg. Now, uh, there are different ways you can view those who are sitting on the street begging, because some are organized beggars, I know that, and they are put there by groups. Yeah. But these two girls came by a lady who was sitting and they gave her some money. Mm -hmm. And the girls, I don't think they were, maybe 11 years old or 12 years old. And it was very nice to witness it, you know. They came away and the lady said thanks. Now, there were many much older people who walked by, um, including myself, because I was going into the post office. I didn't go near the lady, yeah. but I saw this and I thought, they learned that somewhere, you know. 
if they were schooled at home in a home where they were told never share then they won't even witness this you know it, it won't touch their heart but something in how they were brought up led them to know that this is a good thing to do you know